It's Thursday, it's 12.15 and we're live in Westminster. Joining me, Conservative peer Dan Hannan, SNP MP Stuart MacDonald, New Statesman political correspondent Alva Ray and Sunday Times political editor Tim Shipman. Today... I think it was wholly appropriate to use international waters. Aircraft visual, green 150, track and right. What comes next after this encounter between a British warship and Russian military? Ministers announce a ban on TV junk food adverts. We've been to Batley and Spen ahead of next week's by-election. We've all got our own opinions not to follow our previous parents or told yet we need to vote Labour. And what's annoying Nicola Sturgeon? I have to say, when I saw it on social media yesterday, I just assumed it was a spoof. More of that later. Let's start with this bit of breaking news covered here by the BBC. Junk food TV adverts to be banned before 9pm in UK, government says. Yes, they've announced this ban on junk food advertising online uh, before 9pm on TV from 2023 as Boris Johnson tries to keep to his pledge and deliver on tackling the UK's growing obesity crisis. According to government figures, it affects more than a quarter of UK adults. My opening question to our guest today is should things like cakes, pizza and ready meals, any ads promoting those products be shown before 9pm or not? Dan? Well I, I completely agree with Boris on this. Uh, I don't mean the Boris who is now in Downing Street, I mean the Boris who was my Telegraph colleague oh. and a brilliant columnist who I thought put it beautifully in a column that he wrote some years ago when he said who is it apart from you who can prevent yourself going downstairs and tidying up the edge of that hunk of cheese at the back of the fridge. I think there is such a thing as personal responsibility. And the idea that you, you call the full force of coercive law to try and improve people's diets, I think is, is a quite uh, disproportionate one. Apart from the fact that I, I just think this is quite ineffective legislation. You, you realise when you try and define food that is excessively fatty or that, that falls foul of these guidelines, mm. that, you know, you, you'd be banning avocados, you'd be banning olive oil, you'd be banning sandwiches, right, jam. Um, I, when, I, when I listen to people discussing what they call junk food, I can't help detecting a little hint of snobbery. They mean KFC. You know, they mean they don't mean duck à l'orange, right? They don't, they don't mean nice rustic pâté. They don't mean those delicious, uh, you know, salt caramel chocolates that we picked up in Normandy, darling. And, and I think there is a little <laughs> bit of an element here of sort of, uh, of preaching at people who are... It, it's about the people who are assumed to like the food, and that makes me uncomfortable. Well, there is quite a long list. You'll be pleased to know I've been told that actually olive oil and avocados are exempt. Yes, in that. but so that's the point. They had to I've, exempt them. Yeah, well, absolutely. Um, Stuart, do you believe with the old Boris Johnson as described there by Dan Hannan or the existing one at number 10? No, I think this is a perfectly good idea. I'd only wish he'd done it before uh, lockdown as somebody who, when he tried to squeeze into a suit uh, for the first time after a few months at home and, as Dan said, raiding the fridge for the hunk of cheese at the back, I only wish it had happened a bit sooner. And I suppose there is a, a point in what Dan says there. Um, I, 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 I think he's right in that this is clearly going to be targeted at you know, the junk food that a lot of people enjoy. But at the end of the day, we've got to get serious about this. We've got to get healthy. Um, and I think in actual fact, we could perhaps even look to go further. Let's, let's, let's look at junk food advertising across the board, not just what's on television, but what's on the side of buses, what's on social media websites and, you know, what's being advertised at, at football stadiums uh, and all the rest of it. But I think one of the best adverts was when, uh, Ronaldo removed the, um, oh, I would say the brand, but the fizzy oh, juice. I oh, have. I can't say the brand. I've okay. said it. Oops, never mind. When he, when he moved the fizzy Coca-Cola away from his press conference and instead had some water, let's mm. see some let's see some more of that stuff. And I say that as a man who comes from the nation that created Iron Brew and 
the, the deep fried Mars bar. <laughs> Indeed. You're famous for other things too, of course, um, as, as a nation. Tim, uh, what's your view? Should people be able to watch um, advertising promoting some of the, uh, the products that I read out earlier, cakes, pizza and ready meals before nine o'clock? Well, I think they can still get adverts from individual suppliers. They're just not allowed yeah. to put pictures of them out. Um, but as someone who has helped demolish a large hunk of cheese with Boris Johnson, this is obviously a massive sacrifice for the Prime Minister and quite an interesting sort of indicator of the way things are going to go, I suspect, for the rest of this parliament. People say when he got sick that he came out and changed his mind about mm. what to do about lockdowns. Apparently, he didn't, actually. He came out, you know, even reluctant, having nearly died, uh, that he'd ever uh, gone for a lockdown. But what he did come out thinking was that everybody's too fat, and he knew it because he was too. Uh, I'm sitting here, probably clinically obese as well, delighted that Marmite has been excluded. But, uh, you know, this uh, Dan's right. You know, this is a Boris Johnson who's evolved and changed, and... Uh, I think that's going to have a huge impact on quite a, a wide range of uh, policy areas going forward. Uh, he's gone from a, a wild libertarian um, to someone who's happy with nanny state activities. Uh, We're going to see a lot more of it. Well, um, Alva, where are you on this? Are you going to miss these ads? Well, I think, as Tim was saying, I think it's really good that Boris Johnson is now very interested in this as a policy area because of his own personal experience with COVID and part of that being that he was overweight when he caught the virus because this is a massive policy area and a big problem for us as a society. The the obesity epidemic is like one of the things fueling the crisis in the NHS and we kind of need to get a handle on it. I think that this intervention is just fine, but it just barely touches the edges of what we would need to do. I think as Dan was saying, people I don't think that the big the big problem is that people see an ad for junk food on TV and that's what drives whatever patterns of, of eating and activity or whatever. I think it's a much bigger and, and trickier policy area about chronic stress, about people's lifestyles, about their working conditions. And so I think it's a shame that Boris Johnson cares about this clearly and is taking an interest in it, but is doing quite uninteresting things to solve it. But it's worth stressing that we're not actually eating more or more unhealthily than we were, right? Mm. Any one of my... But the issues, obesity it, problem is... Well, no, there is not a growing obesity problem. There was a growing obesity problem in the late 20th century. It's levelled out and on some measures it's falling, right? If, if you're my sort of age, uh, or much younger, uh, you will remember uh, my, my 70s childhood involved flying saucers and monster munch and angel delight, you know. Um, mm. we, we've got this, this rather rosy view. According to, to DEFRA figures, daily calorie intake has fallen from about two and a half thousand to two thousand. So it, it is not true that we're eating more. What I think has changed, and by the way, we're also not eating more sugar or more unsaturated fats. What has changed as a result of this lockdown is that the, the country is in a more authoritarian mood. I, I'm in no doubt that I'm in a minority on this issue because people, as always happens when there's a common threat and a sense of, of a collective peril, people demand the smack of firm government. They become much more intolerant, much more illiberal across a range of measures. And so the idea of telling people what to eat is, right. is going to be much more popular now than it was in 2019. Alva? I think, see, I think people do know what they should be eating already. I think the challenge is, is that it's quite hard to do in the context of modern lifestyles. And I think it's about sort of looking at that. I mean, this very new statesman of me, but I think that you do need to be looking at sort of the bigger <laughs> context of workers rights and, and those sorts of things to really get a handle on this rather than just sort of telling people what to eat. All right we're going to move on. Um, Jonathan Beale the BBC's defence correspondent was one of a number of journalists on board the British ship HMS Defender yesterday when this happened. If you don't change the course I'll be fired. Do you hit me over? The crew donned protective clothing in case that threats followed through. Shots are fired, but they're well out of range. Aircraft visual green 150, tracking right, altitude low. Throughout the transit, HMS Defender detects at least 20 Russian military aircraft nearby. Some far too close for comfort. Now, what you saw there was an encounter between Russian military and the British vessel. The Russian government said it fired shots and dropped bombs into the water. Yes, out of range, but you could hear them there because it said uh, the British vessel was in Russian territory. I'm just going to show you where it was, in fact, uh, on this map because the uh, ship HMS Defender was actually sailing in the Black Sea south of Crimea. Uh, you can see there the dotted line. The British government said they were in 
international waters as they don't recognise the Russian annexation from Ukraine in 2014. Now, the government has put out a statement saying no shots were directed at HMS Defender and that they didn't recognise the claim that bombs were dropped in her path. Officials said Russia had said in advance it was conducting what they called a gunnery exercise in the vicinity. Stuart, can I just um, start with you as defence uh, spokesman? Do you think that this sort of thing is a sign of things to come? We'll see more of it in the future. It could well be uh, a sign of things to come, and that's regrettable. I think the main uh, issue at the heart here is that this was a classic Russian disinformation operation to try and look strong. Uh, you might note, um, some of your viewers might note, that they called in the UK defence attaché and managed to amazingly have a video camera all set up to see him come in and get handed his diplomatic note of protest and then video him leaving. This was a campaign of disinformation to make the Russian government look strong, as though they were wagging the finger in protest um, at the Royal Navy. And I have to say, I'm, 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 with, the, I'm with the UK government on this one. I, the Russian government had plenty of notice this was happening. Indeed, I remember its announcement in Parliament uh, not so long ago uh, that the UK government intended uh, to do this. And the right of freedom of navigation, mm. international law, is an important one to, to defend. But crucially, these are Ukrainian sovereign waters, not Russian waters. Right. I mean, should the government be doing this, Dan, in terms of perhaps being a little bit more muscular about proving a point? Um, a source told BBC diplomatic correspondent James Landale that the defender was not there to pick a fight, but to make a point, to assert its right to freedom of navigation in international waters. Or is that just risky? No. I mean, if there's one permanent interest that we have as a country, it is in freedom of navigation. We're totally dependent on sea transportation. We always have been. Uh, in fact, we, we fought a war in that part of the world once before precisely uh, on, on this issue, and if not us, who? I, I agree very much with what, what Stuart just said, though. I think, uh, from Putin's point of view, he loves to have these constant quarrels because they basically drive support to his regime. He wants the Russian people to be in a sense of constant anxiety and kind of wounded patriotism and feeling under threat so that they support the kind of autocratic regime that he's created there. Even, even dictators depend mm. on a measure of genuine public support. But that doesn't mean that, from our point of view, we should let him get away with it. We, we, we can't allow countries to close off waterways uh, illegally. We, we, of all countries, need to make sure that the international global order rests on established norms and conventions. But is there a danger to that strategy, rightly or wrongly, Alva? Um, I, well, I think that the, I think the really tricky thing, which is sort of newer about this, is the way the Russians are using disinformation, or seem to be, and the way there are two conflicting narratives. I think mm -hmm. that that plays into a much sort of more challenging and bigger challenge around Trump, around Russian potential interference into elections and so on, that I think is harder for the British government to counter. I think it's it's one thing when you have an established narrative, but I think it's very tricky. You know, we've seen in the news reports, it's very much, well, if this happened, then this. This would be an escalation if this were true, but we're not sure. I think that that's where it's... I think I think that's where the big challenge is that it's a it's a war of information as well as the the actual naval side of things. Right. Well, on that war of information and and perhaps a war of words or not, um, Tim Boris Johnson has said that relations with Ru uh, Russia are not at their lowest point. They have been far worse. Uh, well, I mean, you, you don't have to look very <laughs> far back over recent years to see pretty low moments. Um, Alexander Litvinenko uh, was killed in Britain by Russian agents, um, uh, and you. Know, a couple of years ago, uh, they were at it again in Salisbury trying to kill off um, uh, the script owls. Um, you know, they have come to our shores and tried to murder people here um, successfully in one case. Um, uh, so, you know, Boris Johnson himself, as foreign secretary, was involved in expelling more than 100 um, Russian uh, spies from uh, Western countries as a result of all of that. So this has been a long and festering problem. And frankly, Vladimir Putin... Uh, plays these information wars, but you know the only language he really understands is strength. Um, and frankly, you've got more chance of doing business with him um, if you're prepared to stand up to him. Um, and you know, as Dan says, Britain has an interest in um, uh, maritime security. Mm. Uh, the recent Defence and Security Review um, was predicated on a, a more aggressive British maritime strategy. Um, some of the warships that are in uh, the Black Sea at the moment, I think, are going to go on the Far East. Um, uh, where there are problems um, with China um, uh, sort of uh, 
threatening its neighbours as well. So Britain, along with uh, America and NATO, um, is generally trying to be more assertive after okay. a period when uh, Donald Trump, you know, the most powerful leader in the free world, was busy sucking up to Vladimir Putin. So things are changing. And at some level, I think most uh, analysts I speak to in Whitehall think uh, that the Russian president will kind of get the point of that. Um, but you look at, you know, you have to look on the front of the Financial Times today mm. to see that, you know, Angela Merkel and Macron in France are keen to go off and do more business with Vladimir Putin. So it looks uh, from on the basis of that, that that Brexit is going to mean that Britain is increasingly in, back in the orbit of the Americans in taking on Russia and China, while the Europeans um, uh, try to cosy up to Moscow again. All right, we're going to leave it there because uh, we are a week away from the by-election in Batley and Spen. And now the result could have big political implications. Here's Adam Fleming. You can debate for hours whether this is the red wall. It's been Labour for decades, but not in every decade. To the people who live here, it's just Techman Wyke, Cleck Heaton and Batley. This mural actually gives you a really good idea of what this place is like. You've got your market towns and your railway heritage, your big employers like Johnson's Paints and Fox's Biscuits. There's quite a big Asian community, so there's a mosque in there as well. And then you've got Batley Bulldogs, the rugby league team. It really is a picture that paints a thousand words. Um, beans and sausages, do you want to put those over there? But you can't paint the community spirit on display at this food bank set up by Josie and Dillis during the pandemic. I mean, Covid hit everybody hard and probably Cleck Eaton as much as anybody. A lot of people around here get by and are more than one or two paychecks away from, from, from the crisis. And don't get these two started on the issue of transport. Buses are absolute rubbish. So what is the problem with the buses? There aren't enough of them, they, the timetables, they don't hook in with one another. I just had to use the buses the other day and it took me an hour and a half, I think, to get from here to Murfield. And I could have done that in 15 minutes in the car. And it's expensive. Bus fares are far too expensive yeah, for a lot of people. I mean, for what, what it costs you to get to the neighbouring food banks, you could probably buy the best part of a week's worth of shopping. Yeah. So the vision is very clear. A new cricket facility... Which now meet Abdul, who needs £2.5 million pounds to realise his dream of new sports facilities. And he hopes this by-election is a way to get what neighbouring places have been getting. As well as the community at large. Well, we went recently to play at Ellen Cricket Ground. Wonderful facilities for the local community, you know. And, and we just, you know, our jaws were drooling. And we were thinking, well, what is it that they've got and they need that where our needs are not being made. These issues are playing out along every street because this is one of the few places in England that allows election posters on lamp posts. And according to the Muslim Council of Britain, it's also one of the constituencies where the Muslim vote could be decisive. And that's a vote that's changing. Post pandemic, people are looking for uh, investment in jobs and and opportunities and, and just regeneration within the town. Um, I don't think there's any such thing as a, as a Muslim vote. Well, everybody's now, how it is, we've all got our own opinions, not to follow what our previous parents or told, yeah, we need to vote Labour. We all now have got an opinion which we express. So that's the people. What about the politics? Well, this started as a two horse race between Conservatives and Labour. And then it got a whole lot more complicated because of the influence of some of the smaller parties. An independent decided not to stand. He'd previously supported Brexit, which could benefit the Conservatives. Then George Galloway got involved for the Workers' Party, and he is really targeting the Asian community, which could take votes away from Labour. It all feels very fluid and really quite close. And there are actually 16 candidates to choose from. Thrilling for political pundits, but the voters of Batley, a little bit exhausting. And we've been spoilt with by-elections, Alva, haven't we, uh, this year? We've had a few of them, Hartlepool, Chesham and Amersham, um, and people do draw big lessons mm -hmm. from them. Um, tell us about the importance of this one in your mind. 
Well, the first thing to say is that Labour is very, very worried about this one. I haven't spoken to anyone in the Labour Party who thinks that they are going to win at this point. Um, so, that, I mean, I think that's an upset wedding to happen. And I think, uh, you know, journalistic colleagues who are wanting to go up and join the Labour campaign will find it difficult because Labour, I think, don't really want people to see quite how badly that's going. But I think the thing that's worth reminding viewers is that this was not a by-election that needed to happen and really it's the fault of Keir Starmer that it's happening in the first place. This by-election was triggered because um, Tracy Braben, the former MP there, stood down to mm. run for mayor. And um, it, she ran because she was disappointed that she didn't get to keep the, the role in the shadow cabinet that she'd been doing before. And then she announced her intention to stand. At really any point, Keir Starmer could have stopped her from standing, prevented this by-election in, in this summer, or he could have given her a different job in the shadow cabinet. So now Labour is facing this big almighty upset mm. again, this big disappointment, maybe a whole summer where there won't be much other news and we'll just have weeks and weeks of talking about the Labour Party, when I think this was, was entirely avoidable. There are other questions about what has gone wrong on that campaign, but I think the fact that this was entirely avoidable is maybe the thing that people haven't been talking about so much that I think is quite important in and of itself. All right. I mean, it would be a scalp, of course, uh, Tim, for the Conservatives, but uh, listening to Alva, do you agree it, it could be really serious uh, for Keir Starmer? Yes, I do agree, and I agree with um, what she's been hearing as well. I haven't spoken to anybody uh, in any of the parties who thinks Labour is going to win this by-election. In fact, uh, a good few people think there's more chance of George Galloway stopping the Tories um, than the Labour Party. He was 50 to 1 at the weekend. He's about 12 to 1 now. And that, those odds keep tumbling because he's obviously cutting through um, uh, with uh, uh, the Muslim community uh, in that seat. Um, but the implications for Keir Starmer are, are very worrying because, as you say, we've had two by-elections already. Uh, the Tories did really well in Hartlepool and that looked like, oh, they've stoned up the Red Wall. And then they went and... Uh, lost in Cheshire and Amersham to the Lib Dems, and that looked like Boris Johnson hemorrhaging votes in the South. Mm. Um, this is sort of the decider of the three, and, um, uh, you know, it looks like more bad news for Starmer. And slightly bizarrely, he, he's been shaking up his team in the last 48 hours. Um, he's lost a couple of uh, his communications team. His chief of staff is moving a job. His uh, political director is... Uh, is leaving his office to go into the shadow cabinet. Um, it all looks pretty chaotic. I think a lot of people wonder why he's doing that now. He would be better off doing that relaunch after losing this by-election. Um, and people wonder what rabbit he's going to pull out of the hat then, because uh, it looks very much like all the focus is going to be on him and his judgment and his leadership again. Well, we don't have that long uh, to wait. Of course, it's only uh, a week away. A little reminder, you heard Adam Fleming there in the film referring to the list of candidates. We will show them to you here. That's the Batley and Spen by-election. There you can see all the candidates who will be standing. We're going to talk uh, about a row between the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, and the Cabinet Office Minister, Michael Gove. This is the headline in The Herald. Nicola Sturgeon blasts sneering, arrogant condescension of Michael Gove. Now, this was after he said, Michael Gove, he couldn't see Boris Johnson agreeing to an independence referendum before the next general election. And it was foolish to discuss it while the country was still recovering from the coronavirus pandemic. Dan, was he being arrogant? No, I think that's the position that, if the opinion polls are to be believed, is shared by the vast majority of Scottish people. I, I say this as someone who very much supported having a referendum in 2014. I'm all in favour of, uh, of testing these questions. I'm all in favour of allowing countries uh, to decide their, their destiny. And if, if, if Scotland had voted by a single vote the other way, I, I'd have backed it. Everyone promised that they would accept the result either way. But does anyone seriously, even, even people who think that independence is desirable in the, in the long run, does anyone seriously think that this is the moment coming out of the epidemic and just going into the long-term debt and economic crisis? Is, is this really the distraction we need now? Stuart? Well, I know that Dan has given up on uh, democracy, taking a seat in the House of Lords, but we haven't. And he doesn't have to rely on opinion polls. He just has to go back four or five weeks to the recent Scottish Parliament elections, where... People were asked in our national elections to Holyrood and they voted for a pro-independence referendum majority. Not now, as Dan says, but when the Parliament and the Government of Scotland determines that it is right, safe and proper to do so. And so that's how we'll proceed. And I find it very curious indeed that somehow the losing party, uh, by some way, by the way, in that election, the Conservatives, seem to think they have a mandate to determine the agenda and the timetable of the winning party's mandate. So 
We will press on with getting through the COVID crisis. The First Minister has been very clear about that. Mm. But when the Parliament judges there will be a referendum, a referendum there shall be. And I rather suspect Michael Gove knows that. And this is, you know, all about him trying to look as though he's the great defender of the union, but I think we'll see that unravel as time goes on. But we'll bring it forward. We'll bring it forward when we deem it's right, because that's what people voted for. Dan? Well, I'm not sure that is what people voted for. Uh, if you totted up all the all the votes, I don't think there was. I mean, it was 50, what, there was a mild majority one way on on uh, parliamentary votes and a, a mild majority the other way on list votes. But but I, I you know on the on the thing that Michael Gove said, which is not in this parliament, mm. that is a position shared by about two thirds of Scottish voters, very sensibly, very level headedly. I mean, uh, why Dan, on earth, with art. everything going on, would you want at this moment? To, to Dan, throw the country back into the division and the rancour and, and, and the broken friendships that we had well, last time. Well, well, Dan, Dan, this is a canard. There was no narrow majority on constituency votes. The SNP wiped the floor uh, on constituency votes. And mm. all that matters is bums on seats. And the reality is there are more pro-independence referendum and pro-independence members of the Scottish Parliament than not pro-independence members. So okay. we'll stick to what we put to the people. When did we'll that bring become forward, the rule? When did that we'll become the forward, test? We'll bring for, Well, that's how general elections work. And All again, right. I know that you're perhaps unfamiliar with this in the House of Lords, but we have a mandate from the Scottish people to pursue it when the time is right. All right. No, no, this oh, was an but... actual vote. And everyone promised, including you guys, that they would respect the result for a generation. That I want to come back... And people vote. get to change their minds, Dan, All right, which is what they've and, done. And, and on that, I'm going, to, I'm going to interject um, to go back to the issue of when it might happen, Stuart, because what, what are you or the SNP and Michael Gove actually arguing over? Don't you essentially agree with what Michael Gove has said here in terms of the timing? It's just that you don't like him saying it, but actually there's nothing in it. Is there in terms of when it might happen? Let me say this. Michael Gove is entirely entitled to say whatever he likes. Ah. What he doesn't get to do is set the terms that is for the Scottish Parliament to set. So when the Scottish Parliament deems it right, and Nicola oh, Sturgeon, the yeah. First Minister, has said that she would like that to happen mm. in the first half of this term of the Scottish Parliament, but we, we will do that at a time when we deem it so safe. So that's by right 2023, isn't it? But I mean, broadly speaking, that would be by 2023. And Michael Gove was saying about, yeah. not before the next election, which is no later than May 2024. So we're arguing over a matter of months. And really, this is Michael Gove doing a classic Michael Gove. I've almost got to admire it. He loves nothing more than to stir up trouble. But look, he's the one that raised this in his documentary interview with the Telegraph newspaper. The First Minister is getting on with the COVID pandemic. That's what we'll stick to for now. Right. I mean, should he just allow the SNP, Dan, to decide if they're going to have this debate in Parliament as to the date? Well, that, that isn't actually how the rules work, as Stuart knows very well. That you know, the, the, the referendum uh, decision is, is, is very clearly a reserved power. And it was granted before and it was held and it, it produced a decisive result and everyone said that's it for a generation. I suspect that some of the uh, SNP people clamouring now for another vote don't really want one. I think this it, they, they actually want to be seen to be asking for one rather than to hold it at the moment because it is just such a monumentally distracting thing to put on the table with the emergency that we're in. Right. Do you actually want it uh, in the next few years, Stuart, particularly with COVID? Absolutely. We, we can't afford uh, to not have it, particularly with COVID. And I think, I think all that House of Lords Chablis has gone to the good Lord's head, I'm afraid to say. The, the Scottish National Party stood during the election, uh, got re-elected on a mandate that included an independence referendum, and there will be one. All right. Well, look, this is a spat, obviously, um, ongoing, um, Tim and Alva. But in terms of the difference, the material difference over the timing, um, wh when do you think it could, might happen, if at all, Tim? Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm, I vote Coburn in this particular row because there is... Um, this is massively disingenuous on both sides, I have to say. I think, you know, uh, this, this, the truth is Nicola Sturgeon does not want to call a referendum until such a time as she thinks she'll win one. Um, and she's not going to win one until the public actually wants one. And Dan Hannan's right about uh, that. The polls do suggest, uh, whatever the, the results of the Scottish elections, that the public still does not think the time is right. Uh, as, you, as you rightly point out, Michael Gove is, is saying not before... 2024. Um, they're arguing really over the space of a year at most. Um, 
Uh, Michael Gove wasn't being condescending, he was simply stating a fact. Um, uh, Boris Johnson is not going to grant a legal referendum before 2024, um, and quite a lot of people in the SNP think Nicola Sturgeon doesn't really want one much before then either. So uh, this whole debate is a complete um, smokescreen, frankly. Right. I mean, Alva, when do you think it, it might happen? And this issue of the timing, it suits both sides, does it? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with Tim on this, but I think that the thing I would add is that not only is this quite electorally tricky for Nicola Sturgeon in terms of her coming under quite a bit of pressure from her own party to deliver this and to be seen to pushing for this as soon as possible versus the fact that she, as Tim was saying, wants to hold one when she can actually win it. But I think it's also very tricky for the Conservatives because aside from everything else. It's just a, a real Tory fear that Boris Johnson is not very popular in Scotland and Michael Gove is seen as the kind of stronger figure on this issue. So whenever this issue rears its head, I think that it's felt by perhaps people close to Boris Johnson like it's a bit of an attack on him and a sign of loyalty to Michael Gove instead. And I think that there are there are lots of divisions internally in the you know in Number Ten as to how they should be approaching this and um, whether Boris Johnson is really the right the right man for this issue. Right. I mean, how much pressure, Tim, will Boris Johnson continue to come under uh, to allow the SNP to hold this second independence referendum? Well, I think he'll come under huge pressure if the polls in Scotland start suggesting that that's what the people of Scotland actually want. Um, uh, he can buy time with this argument that, you know, we're still dealing with COVID for probably another year. Um, then it will get uh, much more intense. And there are certainly Conservatives who think that at some point um, there will probably have to be a referendum. Um, uh, but certainly legally and constitutionally, they can continue to resist. And they know that, uh, as Alva points out, there are these bitter divisions in the SNP. Nicola Sturgeon likes to look like the tough guy on this one, but actually, you know, she's under huge pressure from the sort of Alex Salmon forces uh, in her own party who are uh, constantly pressuring her to get on with it. But, you know, she's a canny politician and she doesn't want to do that. And well, it's, and yeah. got more chance of winning. Right, Stuart, you were shaking your head, unsurprisingly. I mean, Tim, you're a good journalist. You know better than this. If, if Alex Salmon did one thing, he helped unite the Scottish National Party. The First Minister has just been re elected the first ever government in the devolution age to secure a fourth term in government. The SNP is entirely, entirely behind her. And look, we'll get on with the job at hand, as people expect. It's the COVID pandemic, the recovery from that when we start to get it behind us. It's just as well no one's proposing a referendum right now, certainly not the Scottish government. Mm. And look, it's hardly going to be news to your viewers, uh, Joe, yeah. that Nicola Sturgeon wants to hold a referendum when she thinks she can win one. Well, Absolutely, I'd back her yeah, 100% on that. I think people have clocked that. But um, you would also agree that there are people in the SNP who would like you to go faster? Yeah, sure. And I think it's always healthy in a political party to have... Uh, those kind of tensions. But the idea that the SNP is ripping itself apart over this, we've just won an election with Nicola Sturgeon re-elected as First Minister. We understand the huge monumental task that's right in front of us with COVID. That's what the First Minister is focused on. And when we judge, when the Scottish Parliament judges that the time is right and proper, a referendum will be held. May I ask a question, though, Stuart? If there was another referendum and there was another vote in favour of the UK, would you accept that one? Or would you carry on having more and more afterwards? We'll accept the result, but look, democracy isn't a, a once in a once in a lifetime event. People have once the in right a generation. to change their people have the right to change their minds. And I, and I draw your attention. You know, the once in a generation slogan always gets drawn up. What never gets well. drawn on is the Edinburgh Agreement, which both governments and all parties signed up to, which stated in that agreement, sorry, the Smith Commission Agreement. Uh, forgive me following the 2014 vote, which said that there was nothing in that agreement that prevented Scotland becoming independent. In order to do that, to test that, you need to have a referendum. So if, if people vote people for separation, that's for. it forever. But if they vote for union, you carry on doing it for as long as you like. So that seems to me a little bit unbalanced, a bit asymmetric. Look, they could, they, could vote for a, they could vote for Scottish independence and then chuck us out and change their mind 12 months later. I rather doubt that will happen because what we'll put forward is something that we believe will be good for Scotland, will have good relations with England on a partnership of equals between Edinburgh and London. I think All that's right. something exciting that we can look forward to. Now, tomorrow is One Britain, One Nation Day and schools are being encouraged to sing a song written by some primary school children in Bradford. Let's have a listen to some of it.
And on Monday this week, the Department for Education was encouraging schools across the UK to join in, sing the song, celebrate One Britain, One Nation Day tomorrow, the 25th of June. Um, it's a campaign that has been going since 2013, and we can talk to the founder and chief executive of One Britain, One Nation, Cash Singh. Welcome to the programme. Um, tell us, what's it all about? Um, hi, good afternoon, Joe. Um, good basically, afternoon. it's all about creating a sense of national unity and pride. It's about championing uh, values such as unity, pride, respect, love, mutual respect, kindness and understanding and things like that. Um, it was born, the organisation was born from my sort of career in the police, uh, almost 30 years in the police. Mm. And one thing I wanted to do was uh, was to bring the people together because Throughout my career, you know, there was a lot of reports on segregation and things like that. And I thought, this country has welcomed people from all parts of the world who settled here, made this country their home. And what we need to do is bring out the best in all our communities and speak good about the country, speak good about our people, and create that feel-good factor that I felt was so desperately needed. Because throughout my whole 30 years career, mm. you know, the word cohesion, the word cohesion has always been there. And I feel that more could have been done. So, um, oh, yeah. what I do, what, and, and we've launched a number of campaigns. And in 2019, we had 60,000 people who were part of this campaign. It was just phenomenal. Right. But, but you, Bourbon, yes. Sorry. No, I was always going to say, is, not everyone agrees with you. I'm sure you've seen no. uh, much of the material on social media. We're just going to show one example. This is Angus McNeil, the SNP MP. Um, he, he tweeted, Soviet Union wanted children in Baltics to celebrate One Union, One Nation Day and sing We Are Soviet Anthem, Imperial Stupidity, Chapter 2. Um, what do you make of criticism like that? Well, this is all misinformation, so let me just clarify that, because this is where all the uh, Twitter spat came from. Auburn is a community interest company. It's a grassroots organisation. It's not affiliated with any political party or, or any religious organisation. Mm. It's nurtured by teachers. It's my dream in terms of what was needed. And, and this organisation has grown how, in terms of how the people have put this organisation together. But it's got to such a stage that in order for it to progress further, it needs the backing of government. Ah. And um, so basically we started in Bradford, West okay. Yorkshire, taking yeah. it across. But it's but nothing to do with not what in Scotland or Ireland or anybody part of it. Right. I've put the tens and thousands of pounds in developing this organisation. Okay. So what we want to do now is work with everybody and, and, and create that feel-good factor. But, right, well, Stuart, That's where the problem's been. Well, I'm going to open it up to the rest of the panel, um, Cash. Um, Stuart, listening um, to what Cash has said, um, was it right that uh, Angus McNeil, your colleague, made those comparisons to the Soviet Union? Well, it's, it's an obvious one that someone was going to make, and if anybody was going to do it, it would have been, uh, it would have been Angus. But, look, I think that there's a... I so think he, wasn't, much of what so Cash he was wrong? Is, uh, he was wrong to do it, in your mind? Well, I don't like comparisons to the Soviet Union. It was a tyrannical uh, part of our history. But I think the, the, the central point here is that although Cash's aims, just listening to what he said, there are clearly entirely laudable. Mm. Uh, and I don't, I don't dispute the need for greater cohesion and community understanding and all the rest of it. But I, and I don't blame Cash for what I'm about to say here, incidentally. I think this comes down to Gavin Williamson and the government have been entirely tone deaf in how they've presented it this week. Maybe the best thing Cash could have done was keep the government away from it because they've launched this so-called union project, whatever, I don't even know the real name of it. On the same week, you know, when all these schools are meant to join together in singing this song, when Scottish school kids mm. go on holiday as of three o'clock mm. this afternoon. The other thing, the other thing I was as well I would say is that this just looks, and again, I don't accuse Cash of this, this looks like a paranoid, forced kind of unionism that is not authentic. Uh, it's a bit tone deaf as far as Scotland is concerned, and that's right. before we get to Wales and Northern Ireland. So I'm all for what Cash has just described there. Mm. I'm just not convinced putting a union jack on it is the way to go. There are much better ways to achieve communal harmony than these uh, songs, beautifully sung, 
uh, but I'm afraid rather terrible. Right. Well, Dan, I mean, isn't he right, Stuart? Um, I mean, this is the government overstepping the mark, the Department for Education. Yeah, I, I actually found it incredible that so many people were triggered by a song composed and performed by primary school kids in Bradford. And not, not just Angus McNeil, to be fair. There were, there were plenty of uh, sneering parts of our intelligentsia across uh, the political spectrum about it. I, I think Cash is onto something important. And uh, it may lead to some distaste in, in some elements, but he, he understands this better than most people. I met Cash many years ago. Um, Cash arrived in this country not speaking English. He uh, integrated, he had an incredibly successful career as a policeman. He's now gone on to, 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 to give this back. And he understands the need for any nation to have common symbols and common rituals that bind it together. And, the, you know, the Americans do this a lot. They have flags and bunting and songs and so on. Mm. And a certain kind of European sneers at that and, and finds it uncomfortable. But you know what? They are very good at integrating newcomers. All right. And if we, uh, if we hold up the British brand, when I say we, I mean, I suppose, our intellectual elites, as something to be derided, mm. introduced, we all buy into this kind of BLM, anti-colonialist idea that the, uh, right. the British state is kind of intrinsic, <laughs> then it's very, very difficult for the children of settlers to want to belong, and that is a serious problem that Cash has identified. Alba, there's a lot to unpack there. Mm, I mean, I think my immediate question is, what is the place of Northern Ireland in this? I mean, as, as most viewers will be aware, lots of people in Northern Ireland view themselves as British, Northern Ireland is in the United Kingdom, but it's not actually in Great Britain. Mm. So this one Britain, one nation, I, I would be genuinely interested to ask Cash whether he sees Northern Ireland as, as included in this or not. Cash? I, I see all the four nations included in this, but the question here is that I had to start somewhere, <laughs> you know, because end of the day, I funded this so far out of my own cash. And uh, and like Dan has said, for, I've, I've identified this, having spent 30 years on the ground, that we need to do something. You've got our professional footballers like Marcus Rashford, you know, Raheem Sterling, they've reached the top mm. in terms of the pinnacle of, you know, what they can do. They wear the England shirt, they're on the football, you know, in Europe, and then they get abused. Yes. So what my point is, we need to eradicate this. And this is why, you know, I was talking to John Barnes and, and what we said was, we really need to win the hearts and minds of the next generation. All right, and Cash. that's exactly what we're doing. Well, and yeah. what I don't want to please confuse is, this is no political. It was me who pleaded to DFE, yes. can you spread the message of our, you know, campaign? And that's exactly what they did. All right, well, let, me put, it, let, me, put, put let me put what you've said back Sorry, to... Back, was, no, it's, no, it's gonna... fine. No, it's great to hear from you um, and understand the context. But there is a... Is there a potential issue, Alva, with trying to create or teach a sense of Britishness? Um, well, no, it, well I mean, I think, I think maybe the, the issue is certainly in a Northern Irish context that perhaps Northern Irish unionists won't be thrilled that this song about one nation doesn't actually accurately describe the nation that Northern Ireland is in, oh, let, I mean, let alone... Britain is a synonym for UK. It, 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 it isn't a song about Great Britain, it's, the it's, island. It's, it's a song about Britain. Britain and Northern Ireland, though. I mean, I, but, I mean, I suppose you'd need to get... So you'd need to, you know, do a vox pop of Northern Irish unionists to ask what they think, but I think then especially Northern Irish nationalists, I wonder what they would make of it too. I think... To I just think this whole thing is a perfect Rosash test for the um, culture war that we've been having over the last few years in this country. I mean, the initial reaction of a lot of people in Westminster was that this was like something out of Borat and that uh, Gavin Williamson in a mankini was going to jump out and start saying, make benefit Britain for glorious nation and all that sort of thing. But actually, that kind of attitude is what has led to, uh, has driven a lot of our politics. Um, you know, people... Uh, have voted in the, refer uh, the EU referendum in a lot of these elections in the general election on the basis of feeling and national feeling and uh, having that sense of community and trying to recover a, a sense of uh, togetherness um, that, that they feel has been lost in, in their lives. And uh, people in Westminster dismissed that at their peril. Um, uh, some people uh, in the Conservative Party appear okay. to have learned that. And others uh, have yet to do so elsewhere. All right, um, we've only got a few seconds left, but Stuart, to you, final word on this. Again, look, I, I salute Cash's uh, motivations here, I really do, but I just right. think the worst thing he could have done was let the government get their hands on it. All right, that's all we've got time for. Goodbye to Cash and thank you for coming on the programme. We'll be back on Monday, but because of coverage of Wimbledon, we'll be on at the earlier time of 9.15am. Put it in your diary. That's 9.15 on Monday on BBC Two. I hope you can join me then from all of us here. Thanks to my guests. Bye-bye.